I want you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 4 and Matthew 18. Luke 4 and Matthew 18. And uh, we're continuing the series, Free Indeed. By the way, there's one more message in this series. And uh, I kind of feel like the guy that every week has been giving you bad news, and I'm waiting till the end to give you the good news, all right? So, this, so some of you, yeah, finally, praise the Lord. Okay, so, um, so don't, don't miss the last message in this series, all right? And uh, so th- this message is entitled Wounded Warriors. These two, the two last messages in the series, uh, are huge answers. In essence, we're going to talk about emotional healing this week, and then the last message we'll talk about deliverance. And I'll actually pray uh, over all of you uh, a prayer of deliverance during that last message, and I'm going to pray over many of you today for emotional healing. Uh, Jimmy talked about uh, uh, um, mental healing last week, How to Heal Our Mind, A Mindset Free. I thought it was a great message. And uh, this week, we're going to talk about emotional healing. So look at Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 16. It says, so he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place I always find that funny to say he found the place. I wonder how long it took Jesus to find Isaiah. <laughs> I think he's okay. Psalm, Proverbs. It's okay, no, I'm. <laughs> he. <laughs> That's even funny to me. All right, he found the place where it was written, "The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor." He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. They were fixed on him because this is a messianic prophecy and they all knew it. So they're wondering what he's about to say. And this is what he said to him. He began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Let me, let me tell you what he was saying. He was saying, I'm him. I'm the Messiah. Your Messiah is here. Now, in this passage are the five foundational ministries of Jesus, and we're only going to deal today with emotional healing, but let me just show them to you so you'll know. These are five ministries, foundational ministries of Jesus he wants to do for every person. One is salvation, and the two phrases that Uh, relate to salvation are preach the gospel to the poor, the gospel's good news, and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. In other words, it is now, now is the time that you can accept the Lord and that the Lord can accept you because your sin is going to be appeased. Uh, The second basic ministry or foundational ministry of Jesus is spirit baptism. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. We know the Holy Spirit descended on him when he was water baptized. And he says, he has anointed me. So every person needs to be anointed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, The third basic ministry or foundational ministry is healing. Recovery of sight to the blind is the phrase that that refers to that. The fourth is deliverance. I know I'm going fast, but you may just have to write down the the five words and then figure out which phrase it is later or go back and listen to it. Deliverance is what this phrase is proclaim liberty to the captives. Liberty to the captives. And then emotional healing has two phrases also that relate to it. Heal the brokenhearted and set at liberty those who are oppressed. I came to heal the brokenhearted and set at liberty those who are uh, oppressed. And the old King James translates it bruised. To set at liberty those who are bruised. So I want to talk today. I only have two points. And then we're actually going to minister some healing in this area Uh, But I want to talk to you about broken hearts and bruises. So here's point number one, broken hearts. Uh, In in the Greek, this broken heart is is two words put together. Uh, The first word is suntribo, and it means to break in pieces, to to shatter. It's like throwing a jar down and it's shattering in pieces so that it is unrecoverable. That's what he's saying. And then heart, this word in the Greek is cardia, with a K-A-R-D-I-A, cardia, uh, which is where we would get our word cardiac. It means the heart. So he's saying broken 
in pieces, a heart that's been broken or a heart that's been shattered. Now, I want to ask you a question. Has your heart ever been broken? <laughs> well, everyone. Has your heart ever been shattered? Okay, that's, that's bad. I understand that. But here's the good news. There's someone that can heal that. There's someone that can put every piece back together, and you don't have to live with a broken heart. That, that's, that's good news. Uh, now, I'm going to deal with two strongholds that come in, and, and many strongholds could come in through these things. But I'm just going to take two, one that comes in with a broken heart most of the time, a stronghold of the enemy, and one that comes in with a bruise. What happens many times when our heart is broken is the stronghold of rejection takes place in us. Our heart is broken over a relationship, our friendship, or the loss of someone close to us. Our heart is broken, our heart is shattered over that, and rejection comes in. I want you to just notice when rejection comes in, what happens, but I want you to know that we are susceptible to rejection as human beings. And maybe you, you, you've never heard this before, uh, but this is a, a theological truth. We are actually born rejected. We're born rejected from God. The reason is we're born with a sin nature. And God cannot have, a holy God cannot have a relationship with us unless the blood of Jesus covers our sins and we receive that atonement. So we're born rejected. So we are very easily rejected in this life. Much of what happens to us as we're growing up fosters this wound of rejection. Uh, let me show you a few scriptures. Numbers 14, 34 says, according to the number of days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection. Now, he's talking to the children of Israel, and here's what he says. He says, you're going to know. You, because you rejected me, you're going to know my rejection. And then notice what happens when this happens. Hosea 8.3 says, Israel has rejected the good, the enemy will pursue him. Now, we're talking about that the enemy gets strongholds. Here, when he says, you've rejected me, you've rejected my way, so because you've rejected my way, you've now opened the door to the enemy. That's what he's saying. And I want to show you under broken hearts, seven strongholds that come from the root of rejection, all right? And, and I want you to see these are emotional strongholds. Some people would call them personality disorders. And, and I understand that we have personalities, but there are emotional strongholds that keep people in bondage. And they all go stem back to the root of rejection. So let me show you these. We won't be able to go into them very much, but I'll go into them in just a little bit of detail because there are seven of them. Here, here's number one is anger. People who have outbursts of anger actually have a spirit of rejection. That, that they have rage in them. They have anger, and many times they can't control that anger. When, when I had such a spirit of rejection then any time I thought Debbie was rejecting me, uh, when we first got married, I, I got very explosive, very angry. I, I never hit her, but I hit things. I, I would get angry. Uh, I remember we, had a, uh, we lived in a mobile home when we first got married, and everything was donated to us, furniture, everything, you know, and the refrigerator well, had been given to us by one of her family members. And I got very angry one time in the kitchen because she said something, and I just turned around and hit the refrigerator and put a big dent in it. Um, and she, she went out, you know, and, and I never forget, I feel so sorry for her now. Uh, but she went out and she bought the largest magnetic sunflower. <laughs> Isn't this sad? <laughs> to put over this dent, you know, so her family wouldn't see that, you know, when they came over. Uh, okay, that's, that's rage. I, I felt like, now some of you can relate to this. Some of you have had rage like this. I felt like I had supernatural strength when I got angry. I, I felt like, now there was a television show back in the 70s and 60s, 70s probably, uh, called The Incredible Hulk. I said it last night, not many people related. So a few years ago, there was a movie called The Incredible Hulk, but if you remember, I think they did it in the movie. Yes, they did. But in the, in the in TV show, this is what I remember, you know, this David Bannister, you know, was this scientist and his eyes would turn like this and he would say, you don't want to see me when I'm angry, you know, because he would turn into this supernatural strength monster. Okay, that's the way I felt. 
uh, um, I, got, I got beat up many times as a youngster, and then I had something happen in my life that, that, that put such a rage in me that uh, if I got in a fight, I would get so angry, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't win because I, I, it was just supernatural strength. Uh, and so it was a spirit. I had a spirit of anger that entered me because I had a spirit of rejection. Uh, let me just give you one example. Uh, Sa- uh, Saul disobeyed God. At 1 Samuel 15, verse 26 says, Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king of Israel. And then if you remember what happened right after that, it says, well, I got, I got to read it to you. It's too good. Uh, 1 Samuel 19, verse 9 says, now the distressing spirit from the Lord, the distressing spirit, I do want you to notice from the Lord, an evil. This word, distressing, by the way, is in the Old Testament 663 times. 442 times it's translated evil. The authorized version translates it evil. An evil spirit from the Lord. I'm going to tell you why later it was from the Lord. Came upon Saul. He sat in his house with his spear in his hand. David was playing music with his hand. And then Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he slipped away from Saul's presence and he drove the spear into the wall and David fled and escaped that night. Okay. When, when Saul was rejected, now he rejected God first, but when he was rejected, he opened the door for an evil spirit to come on him. And when that evil spirit would come on him, he would have uncontrollable anger and rage, so much so he tried to murder someone. So when people that have anger like this, um, I'm telling you that it could be a spirit. So here, here's the second stronghold, insecurity. Uh, people who... Uh, constantly need attention. Uh, people who are concerned about where they sit in a meeting. You watch them in boardrooms. They come in and they're trying to, they try to pick their chair out. They just don't come in and grab a chair. They want to they make sure they're noticed. They, wanna, they, they, they need to be recognized. If, if I'm leading the meeting and, I'm, and I compliment two or three people, uh, a person with a spirit of insecurity, I'm not talking about a personality, I'm talking about a spirit. Uh, a person with a spirit of insecurity will come up afterwards and say, why don't you say something about me? It's a spirit. You need to get free from that. Um, uh, and I'm not talking to I'm thinking that there's staff people here thinking, is that me, Pastor Robert? You know, so, okay. Uh, number three is pride. People who portray themselves as having it all together. Let me tell you something you'll notice about prideful people. They talk a lot. They have to give their opinion on everything. Uh, if you're leading a small group, they want to answer every discussion question. You know, what's amazing is it's, it's fun to preach because you can see me, but I can see you. So I can, I, I, it's fun to watch a spouse do this. <laughs> She's thinking, you getting this? <laughs> then in a minute, I'll say something else and he does this. You getting this? You know, I mean, okay. So number four is independence. Person who I, I can make it on my own. I don't need anyone. It's very difficult to develop relationships with them, meaningful relationships. They won't listen to counsel. They're going to do what they want to do no matter what. Uh, this could be from a spirit of rejection, so they, they've developed this stronghold of independence. Number five, those easily offended. These are people who take comments very personally. Uh, you can't joke with them. You have to be very careful. Sometimes you're joking, and all of a sudden you go over the line. Uh, see, uh, we're, talking, we're going to talk a minute about a bruise. You know, a bruise is inward bleeding, and it will discolor on the inside and it'll discolor your skin, but then it can go away. Well, what I understand about a bruise is those capillaries are still wounded, and you can bump it again, and it'll discolor again and start bleeding again, even though it stopped bleeding. But once it gets bumped again, it'll start bleeding again. Okay, that's exactly the way it is. Someone has said something in the past that has wounded you, and uh, so you're in a meeting, and someone bumps that bruise, and it starts bleeding again. But here's the good news. Jesus can heal that. He can heal those things. Uh, these are people you have to, you feel like you have to walk on eggshells when you're around them. You have to always be careful what you say because they're easily offended. Uh, number six, excessive shyness or loneliness. Now, again, I'm not talking about a personality here. I'm talking about excessive shyness or loneliness, a fear of people. Jimmy talked about that some last week. And number seven is control and manipulation. And I want to talk about this for a moment because every person that I've ever met that has a difficulty with control and manipulation, and let me just take it a little further, not just a difficulty, but a stronghold, a bondage in this area, has the spirit of rejection. 
See, when you have a spirit of rejection, you, you're very susceptible to being a manipulator because you have to control people around you and control their responses so they don't reject you. And, and what it really boils down to is you're so hurt because you've been rejected in the past that you want to control them so they don't reject you in the future. People who have a spirit of control and manipulation interrupt a lot. They will interrupt you in a conversation because it triggers something inside of them. They don't even know it's triggering, but they, something starts to remind them in their subconscious, not even in the conscious mind, that of a wound in the past, so they got to somehow interrupt you and stop you from talking, especially when you're confronting them. If you're confronting them about something, instead of listening to you, they keep trying to interrupt you and stop you. They also will um, try to turn it back toward you. You know, you do the same thing. You know, you, you have this problem too. They're trying to just, let me turn the spotlight off myself. That's what they're doing. I was talking to a guy one time and he kept trying to throw it back to me. So, you know, you do this. You know, you know what you do? And so I said to him, I said, okay, let's, let's stop for a minute. I said, let's talk about me for a while. I said, let's talk about me for hours if you want to. I said, I'll, I'll, I'll talk with me about for days if you want to. I said, but when we finish, we're going to talk about you. And I said, you can talk about me as long, I really, I said, I'll go days with you because it will not hurt me because I'm not the one wounded here. But you are so wounded that you try to stop me every time I talk about you. And you need healing. You need to be healed. If you'll just keep your mouth shut for a moment, that's what I wanted to say, then, then you can get healed. Uh, people who uh, try to control and manipulate will control through intimidation. You ever met a person who's very intimidating? That's because they don't want you to talk. They don't want you to say anything because it might hurt them. They're, they're, these are hurt people. Let me give you an old expression. You probably heard this. Hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. In other words, people who've been hurt hurt other people. Offended people offend people. Okay, so uh, they'll try to do it through intimidation. They'll also try to do it through pity. They'll try to get you to feel sorry for them. Uh, you know, you, you, you call someone in to confront them, and they know they're going to get confronted on something. And so you just, in ca casual conversation, say, uh, how you doing? And then they'll unload. They'll, they'll say, well, not, not doing well. Uh, I've been sick. My parents not doing well. Uh, you know, had, had this. Business has gone down. Dog died. Our dog died. And they try to make you feel sorry for them. What they're doing is they are trying to control and manipulate the conversation. They're trying to say to you, listen, I've had enough bad news. Don't give me any more. It's, it's manipulation. I'll tell you another way people manipulate, crying. They just start crying. Now, I'm, tell, I'm telling you the truth. Listen to me. It's amazing how many smiles we're getting today. Uh, <laughs> it's because you start confronting. They start crying. And, and basically what they're saying is, you're hurting me. You're hurting me. Stop, stop hurting me. Stop hurting me. And they're crying to get you to stop because it's not just what you're saying. It's what everybody else has said that has never been healed. See? Uh, and, and it's manipulation because I, I can tell you why. Because they can stop. Uh, think about this. You ever had a child? just throwing a fit, just crying, wailing, throwing a fit, and you say, you want some candy? And they stop just like that. It's like they're acting like you're killing them, but candy does it, you know. So, uh, and we, you know, with our children, we didn't allow that. When our children would cry like that, we'd say, uh, you keep crying, you're going to get another spanking. And they could stop. Of course, with grandchildren now, we say, you want some candy? <laughs> so I... <laughs> Okay, here, here's the second. We talked about broken hearts. Let's talk about bruises. Bruises. And I could have put the word Jesus heals in front of both these points. Jesus heals broken hearts. So if you want to put that, you can. Jesus heals broken hearts and Jesus heals bruises. Remember, it says to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And the old King James says to set at liberty those that are bruised. And a bruise is inward bleeding. But here's what I really want you to notice. It says to set at liberty. To set free people who've been bruised. Okay, let me just say what that means. That means that a bruise can hold you in bondage. See? If Jesus said, I came to set people free that have been oppressed and bruised and crushed, then that means that a bruise can hold you in bondage. This word means crushed. Well, I asked you a moment ago, has, has your heart ever been broken? Sure it has. Let me ask you this question. You ever been crushed? Something ever happened that it just crushed you? The loss of a marriage. The loss of a relationship, the loss of a family member. I'm not trying to be insensitive when I say these things because I know they're real. But it, it crushes you. 
Well, what happens is the enemy comes in, and here's one of the strongholds that happens when, when that happens, is unforgiveness comes in. Uh, and now, in Matthew 18, uh, I don't have time to read the whole story, but Jesus said, how often should my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And Jesus, uh, Peter said this to Jesus, and Jesus said, you know, 70 times 7. Then he tells his story, and he says a certain man owed, and what he owed in today's currency would be about $52 million. And he went to his master, and his master forgave him. Okay, that represents salvation. So Jesus is talking to us about a believer, a saved person. And he says, but the same person went out and found someone who owed him $44 in today's currency, $44, and threw him into prison until he should pay what was due. And then he says, what do you think the master's going to do about this? And I'm going to pick it up then in verse 32. It says, then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you're a wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry. Now watch this phrase carefully. And delivered him or turned him over. Delivered him to the torturers. I wonder what the torturers would represent. One version says tormentors. Until he should pay all that was due to him. Now I want you to notice very carefully, Jesus tells the story, but then he says something that we really need to notice. Verse 35. So, so, my heavenly Father also will do to you. If each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother, he's talking to believers, his trespasses. So, so what will the heavenly father do if you don't forgive? He's going to turn you over to torturers. Now I want you to remember that an evil spirit from the Lord came on Saul. I want you to remember Jesus said, my heavenly Father will turn you over to the tormentors, the torturers, if you don't forget. Um, 1 Corinthians 5, there was a man living in sin. Paul said, turn him over to Satan. Turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit may be saved. Deliver such a one to Satan. Okay, why? Why would God ever do this? Listen to me very carefully. Think again about the Old Testament. When Israel would reject God, God would turn them over to the enemy. Why? so they'd repent. <laughs> and so they'd come back to God. So they would know what bondage is like. And they would not stay in that bondage because if you stay in that bondage, you die. So he, if you're going to not forgive someone, he's going to allow you to be tormented so you will forgive. Because otherwise, you're going to live a miserable life. He wants you to say, I don't want to live this way. I want to come back to God. The reason I'm saying this is you need to understand you can't be delivered until you repent. God is the judge. Uh, James 4, 7 says, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Please hear me. You can't resist the devil until you submit to God. And by the way, there's another scripture on forgiveness to show how Satan takes advantage of us. 2 Corinthians 2, by the way, 1 Corinthians 5, Paul said, turn him over to Satan. But this guy, they turned over to Satan, repented. So in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, forgive him now. Forgive him. Receive him back into the family. And this is what he says, 2 Corinthians 2, 10, 11. Now, whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. If indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Now, watch why Paul says we forgive. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. Okay, now let me tell you how Satan takes advantage of us and explain to you how a wound opens us up to a spirit coming in a spirit of anger or a spirit of unforgiveness our spirit of fear, our spirit of rejection, our spirit of bitterness. Um, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 says, Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Transforms himself. Now, this word transforms, uh, the root in the Greek, uh, and some versions will even translate this word this way, masquerades. It's like going to a masquerade party, and you've got one of those faces that you hold on a stick up in front of your face so people can't see who, see who you really are. So this is what Satan does. He pretends to be a good angel, but he's not a good angel. Now, I want you to think about this. The Holy Spirit is a comforter. Satan is the tormentor, okay? But what he does when you get hurt is he puts, holds a mask up and he pretends to be a comforter. Uh, for instance, let's say that uh, Debbie and I are in an argument about something and she says something to me. 
and, and then I leave, and here's what Satan does. He comes and he puts his arm around me, and he pretends to comfort me. And he says to me, she, she shouldn't have said that to you. Uh, that, that was very, very dishonoring. She shouldn't have said that. And, and after all you've done, and not, not only that, you remember what she said last week? And he starts talking like he's comforting me. Oh, she's, you're, you poor thing. You're mistreated. You know, she shouldn't talk to you like that. And then, this is what he'll say. This is where he'll get to. He'll say something like this. Now, all of you have had something like this happen. You know, you, you, you'll never be able to get over this. You'll never get over this. What just happened? You can't forget this. And here's what we think. We think, you know, I'll forgive her, you know, because I'm a Christian and a pastor too. So I'll forgive her. <laughs> but I'm not forgetting this. And Satan will say things like this. You just saw her true character. So he just lies. Okay, if I agree with him and put my arm around him and say, yeah, you're right. Thank you so much for being such a good friend, for comforting me in this time. Okay, he just comes in. It's an open door. And now bitterness, unforgiveness, resentment, anger, malice, hate, envy, jealousy, pride, independence, all these things come in. I used to enter. They're there. And now they stop being comforters. They become tormentors. You follow me? Okay. So here I want to go through deliverance, but I've got this wound over here. And and so, someone is praying, Lord, I, I, I just take authority over this spirit and this spirit and this spirit. And here's what these spirits are doing. They're saying, we don't have to go. We don't have to go. We have ground. We have legal ground to stay in this body. Okay, they have legal ground until this thing gets healed. Now, I, I've been saved. I'm gl- I know you're glad to hear that. I've been saved. <laughs> I, I've, I've gone through emotional healing. I've, been deli- I've gone through deliverance, and I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Listen to me, though. The biggest change in my life, other than salvation, Debbie will tell you, is when I went through emotional healing. Because when I got healed of stuff, when I was um, uh, young, about 13 years old, some boys surrounded me in a barn. And uh, they were, you know, we're going to beat you up. And there were like four or five bigger boys, older boys. And I thought they were. And I got so scared, I started crying. And then they started mocking me and making fun of me. And you're not even worth beating up. You know, you're just such a little girl, a little sissy and all. And I just, and, and they left. Well, boy, I'm telling you, Satan came in that barn and he started comforting me. This is never going to happen again. You're never going to let this happen again. And rage came in me. And the next time I got in a fight, I hurt the guy seriously. Because rage came, a spirit of rage. And that was in me again after, after I got married until I got, and I had to go back in time and allow the, submit that memory to the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to heal that memory. I remember I also, I made a vow that I'd never cry again. I didn't cry for 23 years. 23 years from that time, never shed a tear. And let me tell you, tell you that happened. That after, after I got healed, the guy took me through emotional healing, I was telling him how I never cried again. He said, well, the Lord will lead you. He'll lead you and there'll be a time when you'll cry. And a few years after that, I, I couldn't sleep one night, and I'd just gotten a new Reader's Digest. And so I got up to read the funny parts, humor in uniform, campus comedy, you know, laughter is the best medicine. So that was all I was going to read. And then the little things at the end of stories that are funny, you know. And so I was just flipping through. While well, I was reading one of the, let's say, laughter is the best medicine, when I flipped over to read the second part of it on this page, just like that, I saw a, a, a headstone at a cemetery, a little girl standing there, releasing a balloon, and the title was, When Daddy Doesn't Come Home. And I thought, I'm not reading that. <laughs> and my daughter, Lane, was about three years old at the time. I thought, I'm not reading that. And the Holy Spirit said to me, yes, you are. I said, no, I'm not. I'm not reading that, Lord, because that'll hurt. I don't want to hurt. I'm not reading that. He said, yes, you are. He said, you're going to read it, and you're going to cry, and you're going to like it. I said, I don't want to cry, and I don't want to like it. He said, you're going to read that. You're going to read every word of it. it. took me about two hours. And sometimes I just read one word. And I cried, and I cried, and I cried. And the Lord healed something in me that happened when I was 13 years old. Now, I'm telling you, God wants to heal you from past hurts and past wounds. I'll tell you one more story, and then I'm going to minister to you. Debbie and I were ministering with a couple one time with the man who had been unfaithful. We had him in our living room, 
and we're administering to him, and this man started talking about how God was using this in his life. And I looked over at this woman who had, you know, puffy eyes from crying, and she's bent over, oppressed, pushed down, bruised. And I thought, he doesn't have a clue how much he hurt her. He does not have a clue. He's talking about how God's using this in his life. And his wife has a broken heart. And I felt like I could see her soul. And, and it was like she had, in her, her soul had been beat up. Like, like, like if he had beat her up physically, and she had two black eyes and a bloody lip and, and some broken ribs, you know, and an arm in a sling or something. I, mean, I, I thought, this woman is so, and he doesn't have a clue. And then I just, I said something before, it just kind of came out of me. I, this guy's saying, in the Lord, showing me this scripture and this scripture. And I, I, I'm sorry, but I just said to him, I said, you make me sick. <laughs> and he said, what? I said, you make me sick. I said, you're sitting there talking about how much God has used this in your life. And your wife is over here shattered. I said, you ought to be on your knees begging her forgiveness. That's what you ought to be doing. Now, let me, let me say something to you. If someone's hurt you, and that person may never get on his knees and ask your forgiveness, let me tell you that Jesus got on his knees and washed the disciples' feet. He will get on his knees in front of you and take that hurt off of you and wash you and set you free from that. Now, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to just close your eyes. You can bow your heads if you want, but just close your eyes. Because I'm going to minister to you in her healing for a moment. And we've set aside time in the service, so don't, don't start thinking about getting out, going. Don't do that. Because right now, something is going to happen to you at every campus. Every year, that it's going to change your life, I promise you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit, now just keep your eyes closed. I know it's a temptation. Just keep your eyes closed so you can have a time alone with God. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to bring some memories to your mind right now that he wants to heal today. And you're going to start getting some memories. Maybe some memories of something traumatic that happened to you as a child. Maybe verbal abuse. Maybe physical abuse. Maybe sexual abuse. Maybe something that happened with parents or with a close friend. Maybe something that happened with a spouse. Maybe something that you did that you are still so ashamed of. Sometimes when we need to forgive, we need to forgive ourselves. So I'm asking, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit, I'm asking him, and I think it's, it's already starting, but I'm asking the Holy Spirit to bring memories to your mind right now that he wants to heal. Holy Spirit, I pray right now, every person at every campus, I pray you'll bring memories to our minds that you want to heal today. That you want to heal them today. I pray you'll bring them to our minds right now. Now, let me just say, there could be some hurt, some real pain when the memory comes to your mind, but that's about to go. You'll know that you will feel the pain go in just a moment. You'll still have the memory after this day, but you'll, you won't have any more pain with it. And if a spirit came in at that time and, and took you into bondage, I'm going to cast that spirit out also. But I'm going to ask you to do something as an act of your faith at every campus, every campus, and, and every service so far, it's been the majority of every person of the whole service. But I'm going to ask you if the Holy Spirit, and sometimes, let me just tell you, you might have a memory, you think, oh, that's not even a big memory to me. Don't tell God what, what a big deal is, because he, if he brought it to your mind, there's a reason that he wants to heal it. But if you have a memory, a memory or a group of memories that have come to your mind as an act of your faith, I want to pray over you, and I want to lead you in a prayer, but I want you just to stand up right where you are. So just stand up. Every campus, don't, don't be embarrassed. 
because it's going to be a lot of us, obviously. Obviously, all of us have been, I named it Wounded Warriors because this world's a war. So we've been wounded a lot in this war. So if a memory has come to your mind, the Holy Spirit's brought to your mind, I want you to stand up at every campus, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And as I pray this prayer out loud, I want you to pray it out loud after me. And don't be embarrassed at all. Don't be ashamed to pray the prayer. Let's pray it. And what we're going to do is we're going to submit the memory to the Lord, our memories, and ask the Lord to heal us. And I'm, I'm telling you, it's amazing. You will feel, as I'm praying over you, you'll feel stress leave you. You'll feel it. So I want you to pray. If you're standing, you have a memory. I want you to pray this prayer after me and out loud, all right? Pray this prayer. Father, I submit these memories to you. I ask you to heal me now from all the stress and give me holy forgetfulness. I choose now by an act of my will to forgive to forget and to be healed in Jesus' name. Now, let me pray over you. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you that you heal memories. And right now, Lord, as I'm speaking, I command all stress related to these memories to go right now in Jesus' name. And I command every spirit that attached to these memories to go in Jesus' name. Every spirit of insecurity, every spirit of fear, every spirit of anger, every spirit of bitterness or unforgiveness or resentment or control or manipulation or rejection or unforgiveness, I command you to go right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And Lord, I thank you that you heal our souls, that you heal the brokenhearted, that you set at liberty those who are bruised. And I declare to Satan, you can never again use these memories against my brothers and my sisters as they are healed today in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now just stay standing and anyone else, if you're not standing, you can stand up with us. Uh, we do want to have a time. If you're on the altar ministry team, why don't you come on forward at every campus if you're on the altar ministry team. Come on forward, and, and I'll go back to the campus pastors in just a minute, but just come on, all the, all the uh, altar ministry team at every campus, come on to the front, be ready to minister. You may need to pray with someone. You may need more inner healing. Let me just tell you, you ought to get this prayer that I did and write it down. Go get the CD or go on the web, write this prayer down. Have someone pray over you. If memories come to you, get with someone, because you may start having some memories over the next few weeks that you need uh, to be healed. And there, every single memory you can submit to the Lord, let Him heal that memory and have someone pray over you a confirming prayer that memory's healed and to cast the enemy out where He took ground. All right? So we, we got started today. But if you need prayer for any reason, I'm going to pray over us. After I pray, we're going to have one more worship song. I know it's not supposed to get bad till 3 o'clock, by the way, so don't, don't leave. That's what the weather said, and the weatherman's always right. <laughs> So, all right, so, uh, so don't leave if you don't have to, all right? But uh, here's what we're going to do. If you need prayer for any area after I pray, you come on down. If you don't need prayer for something else, then let's worship God. Let's have one more worship song. And if you just got healed of something, you ought to be able to really sing this worship song. So, Holy Spirit, I ask you to draw every person that needs prayer right now, further prayer in Jesus' name, amen. I was 19 years old when I gave my life to the Lord and everything changed. I didn't have any desire to go back to that old life. I wanted to walk with the Lord and learn more about Him. And some people helped me to learn the Bible and to learn how to pray and to learn about my new life in Christ. And that's what we want to do for you. I am so excited that you've given your life to the Lord. He's forgiven all of your sins and you're on your way to heaven. But we need to learn some things now about the Bible, about prayer, about some basics of the Christian life so that you can be victorious and live for the Lord like I know you want to. So we've designed a class called Fresh Start. And I want to encourage you to sign up for this class because we want to help you grow in your walk with the Lord now. I love you and I'm so proud of you.